All right, um, Minnesota Viking General Manager Rick Spielman, I believe, um, with uh, one of the, some would say, key factors of this radio show, uh, not present in his chair right now. I think uh, to steal to steal a general managerial or coach, um, a coach cliche, I guess it'd be next man up. Uh, we just got to move on with uh, Sans Paul Charchin for the beginning of the interview. Paul Allen, Ben Lieber, and uh, now uh, running into the game, causing a delay of game penalty. Where we're uh, now twelfth man up. on the field, two thousand nine, <laughs> right here. Wow! Someone was wow. supposed to lock you yeah. in the bathroom. Oh, I can't <laughs> believe you got out. Okay, we were going started. real smooth till you showed up. Right, right on, man. So I think for the remaining show today and tomorrow, now Fahu Tahi uh, will be your nickname off that <laughs> there reference. There we go. Hi, Rick. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I always enjoy this. Right on. Combine 2020. Really? Yeah, no, I do enjoy uh, this. Good. Thank it's you. a favorite time of the year. It's a tradition. Yes. Yeah. Well, it beats the alternative. I mean, being in the hotel room looking for nickels and dimes and quarters between, like, couch cushions <laughs> and stuff like that, right? No, uh, Church is there sitting trying to get some lead <laughs> on his fantasy football for next year. Oh, so of course, yeah. I know yeah. where those, well, yeah. those yeah. questions are going to come from and oh, what yeah. angle they're coming in at. Well, it's, Hot. I mean, you, you have done this longer than all of us and certainly at a higher level. Ben played, I call games, Church the identity with uh, fantasy football, you know, and, and we've had a lot that of sounds com- like an insult to we, me. We, <laughs> oh, well, hey. We've had a lot of conversations, Mr. <laughs> General Manager. I just, I'm speculating here. I have to imagine where you are now from a salary cap standpoint, the drafts coming up, uh, just so many things circulating right now. This, I'm going to venture to guess, this is one of the, if not the trickiest off seasons you faced as general manager of this team. Is it accurate? Yeah, no, there's a lot of decisions that we have to make. I know uh, from a cap situation standpoint, I know we'll sit down and visit with all of our players' uh, agents this week at mm-hmm. some point or another. I know when we get back from the combine, the number one thing here, though, too, is to make sure we're getting everything we need to get done from the college perspective to get prepared for the draft. That's right. why we're here. Uh, but you can get a lot of other business done while you're here as well. Uh, but when we get back from the combine, uh, then we got another two weeks before the new league year begins. So it gives you a little more cushion to reassess where you're at, uh, t- talking to our current players, agents, you know, where we're at with the draft. So we'll go back and have meetings when we get b- uh, from this combine and kind of finalize our plan as we go forward. You know, you mentioned the other business you can get done, Rick. All the agents are here. Most of them are here. You can talk to your own your own free agents. You've got a ton of unrestricted free agents on roster who played meaningful roles this year. Everson Griffin, Trey Waynes, uh, Rashad Hill, uh, Harris, Sandejo, Alexander, Curse. There's a lot of work with your own guys, and i got to believe that, that part of that process starts to percolate now as we get close to the new league year. Yeah, we, we started right after the season. Uh, we took a week. I know the coaches got out of their week. We started um, just the process on – what we do during the off season. So when the coaches came back, we had meetings on our team, mm-hmm. where we're at from a roster standpoint. Then we had meetings on the draft when we had all the college scouts come in. And then uh, the week uh, last week, we had our final meetings on free agency and kind of who we may be potentially looking at in the free agent market. So now we've kind of got all worked out of all three of those buckets. Yeah. When you come down here and then you can actually start talking uh, to the agents to kind of see where you're at. And as you know, we value all of our players. All of those players have been <laughs> yes. very good players, and we would love to keep, keep them all. all. <laughs> yeah. You want me to hit the we button from one. the last, right. the last, <laughs> the last ten, 10 years? years. That's yeah. right. <laughs> but you do have to – it's uh, going to be some uh, difficult decisions to make. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I have the, – the Coach Zim and the coaching staff has done a fantastic job if some of these guys are not back and some of the young guys that haven't had an opportunity to step up, just, you know, an example of the Anthony Harris's of the world who finally got his opportunity. Right, right. Uh, you look at Eric Wilson when he had to go there and play. Uh, so there are a lot of guys that we feel that we have a really good young core behind those guys, and hopefully we can keep them all. More than likely we're not going to be able to, uh, but you have to have faith and trust um, which has proven year in and year out that these coaches do a great job developing these young talents. So when we do lose players, um, their new players are able to step in and we don't lose a beat. Well, you talked about the the coordination right after the season between the coaches and your personnel uh, people. I imagine part of that is you look at these free agents and you say, 
This guy's really, really important going forward. This guy might be in the middle. Maybe we can do without this guy. And then you also look at the depth you've got behind him and how confident you are there. And that helps maybe structure. But you have to weigh after. in also, okay, the depth of the draft at that position. Yeah, can sure. we, if we don't sign this guy back, will we able to be able to fill that need in the draft? Yeah, or and short term. That, yeah, and that's the same thing in the free agent market. Mm -hmm. We've always built through the draft and complemented in free agency. But if player X we cannot keep or he's not going to be on the roster, are we going to have to go to the free agent market because that's a stronger area? Yeah. That's a stronger position in a free agent market than it maybe is in the draft, and we'll be able to fill that that way. Or let's just hold on and wait because we don't have to play till September <laughs> that we'll fill – you yeah. know, that spot when the draft comes. Ben Lieber has position flexibility. I like Afadi <laughs> Odenabo. He <laughs> plays here. He plays with the Vikings Entertainment Network. Um, you have an interview with the VEN to do momentarily. Sneak one in for the GM quickly. Go. Yeah, I'll sneak in just a quick question. As you kind of went through the timeline of, of what's happening in the past to lead up to this point here at the Combine and then what's going to happen here before the new league starts, you know, the March 20th date with the new league starting – and there are some contracts that, that sort of become guaranteed within the Vikings organization. Is that, is that necessarily a deadline, or is that just a, a marker for you guys to, like, start making decisions? Like, for the fans' perspective, are they expecting things to happen the next two weeks, the next three weeks before that March 20th deadline, or is it not really a deadline per se? No, there is a deadline because, for example, if a player X, you know, has a $3 million league year roster on the first day of the league year or third day of the league year okay that roster becomes guaranteed well we're not going to guarantee that roster and then cut the guy right i mean you can't do that yeah. that's you know Foolish. so as we go through this the, the the final piece that comes in is the financial piece and that's why rob is in all our meetings as well brzezinski our cap guy and so he can lay out from a financial piece okay if you want to do x y and z this is what it's going to look like against our cap but you also have to understand that we do have some core young players still coming up through that if we do X, is that going to potentially affect us from signing Y maybe a year or two from now to a significant contract? Come so back. all that plays into into your decisions. Yeah, Come back perfect. when you can, okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, ben Lieber. Uh, ben, ben Lieber. I'll come with com. you. Thanks. No, 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 no. <laughs> hey, um, um, you don't get out that easy, right? With, um, with Kirk Cousins, where he is contractually for you guys off the best season of his career, do 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 you have any interest in, in redoing, restructuring, or anything with this contract? A, to keep him here because he's really good, but B, to find some flexibility elsewhere. Uh, we've discussed all those things, and, w you know, we'll finalize that plan. I know uh, the most important thing is I know Gary Kubiak coming in as our offensive coordinator, uh, Kirk playing in the same system for the second year in a row, which is first you know, time. First time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So that makes a difference. But yeah. uh, and the coaching staff, Coach Zim and the offensive staff, uh, did a phenomenal job of identifying what works for him and why he was so effective uh, was because they focused on what he can do well, not what he can't do. Yeah. But that's for any player. If you look at any quarterback or whatever position, you want to try to hone in on what does this guy do best and how do, can we utilize that in our scheme. And he did. Uh, he, he had a phenomenal year last year. Yeah, for I was us. just going to ask you to evaluate uh, Kirk's season in your mind, how you, how you feel like he progressed from last year to this <coughs> year. And, and going forward, what, what would you like to see him do better? I think some of the things that you've seen, you know, it was always a knock, can he win the big game? Uh, and I think in this system, being comfortable with the play action, uh, the building up the running game, the running game being successful, able to take the shots downfield, because when he does have time, I think he's one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the league. Yeah. Uh, not only short and intermediate, but the shots that he takes down the field. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to go down in Dallas and, and win a big game down in Dallas on prime time, uh, you know, in a Denver game when we didn't play very well in yeah. the first half yeah. to bring us back from that. Or even not to kill the game in the first half by trying too hard and accepting there is a second half. Right. And those are all the things. And, you know, the New Orleans game, game. Yeah, yeah, speaks for yeah. itself. Signature so game. you're seeing things that Kirk Cousins can do for this franchise and that he did things this year that – you're hoping that franchise type quarterbacks can do as long as you marry up the scheme and the system and mm -hmm. us being able to still 
do the things we do well offensively, but also playing good defense. It's a whole team game. It's not just on the quarterback. I know usually the quarterback and, and, and the coach are going to get the biggest blame for it. Um, but you've seen a lot of progression from his first year to his second year, familiar with the building, familiar with the people, and we're just expecting bigger things in the future uh, going into next year with him. Well, Rick, your um, your your guys' work in the seventh round last year was spectacular, the, 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 and, and needed, too. I mean, because <laughs> – I think mm-hmm. the biggest work was – BC had to play, man. Yeah, no. It, you know, it Chris was Boyd on special teams. How we got all those picks was yeah. I think we traded down, down. traded down three times yeah. in mm-hmm. the third round and still got our guy in Madison, who we, we coveted in the third round. Yeah. But a lot of that, and I give a lot of credit to Jamal Stevenson, our college director, and mm-hmm. the phenomenal job the scouts do to George Payton, is we really study and understand not only the players on that board, but when we move up and down and what's the threat of moving up and down. And, and okay, if we move down three spots, could we lose the guy that we truly covet? You know, there was an example we had trades on the uh, – table when Bradbury was there and with Irv Smith was there well yeah. we knew that if we traded out of that we weren't going to get those guys yeah. because we knew they weren't going to last uh, very much longer so it's just having a feel for the opportunities of when those trades present themselves when you pull the trigger and when you don't and that ended up being pretty shrewd with Madison because <clears throat> cons- the consensus was at the time of the draft that Madison was not going to go in the third round but you had targeted him. I think somebody correctly identified inside the organization, A, he's good, and B, we can move down and still get him. And that's part of – that's some real draft savviness that that ends up unlocking a lot of other players later. And I think that's that ended up being a, a sizable win for the, for the team on draft day. And that's, you know, that's why we've always had the philosophy of, of being very active. Uh, but I do yeah. have a lot of faith in our system. Uh, I know how hard we study that, how many scenarios we go through to get prepared for that day. Yeah. It's, you know, we don't get to play the following Sunday. We got one shot a year at this thing, yeah. and we put, mm. you know, I, I'm very blessed with a lot of smart people around me in specific areas. Uh, and I'd give credit to the analytics team, too, uh, to Scott Kuhn and, and Rex Johnson. And the input they have is just another tool to help us make those decisions and hopefully making the right ones. Vikings GM Rick Spielman from the Combine, a second and final segment with the GM next. It's 9 to noon. So, um, you know, in in lauding you and the team's approach with the seventh round last year with Austin Cutting and Ola B.C. Johnson and specifically Chris Boyd, you know, this we're, we're going to have Mike Zimmer on the radio show tomorrow, so I'm going to ask him this too because he, he worked intimately with him in the secondary and the whole thing. But what do you expect from Boyd as a cornerback in 2020? Not not just leading you in special teams tackles, but if he has to play markedly more corner, what can you expect? I, th- I think as you sat there and evaluated the season and what you want to see with all these young guys uh, just in general is where they're at when they come in and then how are they progressing through training camp, mm-hmm. how they're progressing through the season to where it's amazing once they understand the defense and they don't have to think, then they just go out there and play with their natural ability. Uh, Chris Boyd was on the same track. I guess a, a comparison I would be making to him is Anthony Harris, yeah. who came in as a rookie, didn't play on defense, but he ended up turning out to be one of our best special teams players. And when you see especially the defensive guys that continue to grow on special teams, it tells you they're a pretty good football player because they have to block, they have to go down and tackle, they have to cover, they have to be able to run and do all that. And Chris Boyd, from where he started at the beginning of the season to where he ended up at the end of the season, especially most of his playtime was on special teams, he was, if not the top, one of our top special teams players. And that comes, I think, a lot of times with these young guys um, with the confidence they build as they as they get out there. You know, one of the younger guys uh, that uh, I'm hoping you guys have not touched on yet as I stepped away there for a second, uh, Oli Udo. You know, you guys found him out of, out of Elon. I mean, a guy that uh, <laughs> did <laughs> the best. <laughs> did, did, you know, still doesn't have a lot of football snaps under his belt. You know, didn't didn't start playing until he was a much older in high school. But how do you see his development coming along, and what do you think he's going to contribute to 2020? I, I give a lot of credit to uh, Andrew Janoco because he coached him down at the East-West game. Uh-huh. And when we didn't make the playoffs last year, mm-hmm. five of our coaches were down in that game. And it gave you an opportunity. It gave our coaches an opportunity 
to go down there to be with these guys in meetings to actually coach them on the field for a week in practice. So when he came back, and we're getting into that Saturday realm, uh, we had a lot of good intel on a lot of those guys that the, that our coaches had had for that week down at the East West. I think like Ole, Armand Watts. Yeah, yeah, Armand Watts was another example of that. And Robert Rodriguez, who coached down there, came back and was a big fan of Armand Watts. And Armand Watts played well for us. But I think, you know, the one thing, I know we didn't play starters basically that last game against Chicago because we were locked in at the sixth seed. But we got all those guys out there and actually got them NFL game experiences, which is rare during a season where they can get a full game under their belt. You see them in the preseason, but now you get a chance to see them against Mac who, and guys like that. So when we went back and evaluated that tape, you can see how much progress, progress these guys have made. And I give a lot of credit to Rico Dennison and, and, and all of our coaches because they are truly great developers of talent, and you see that as uh, these guys keep coming up through the ranks. There could be another small school prospect who uh, ends up being a, a similar story, and he's from Minnesota, St. John's guard Ben Barch, who went to the Senior Bowl and by most accounts looked pretty good. And, you know, we don't – St. John's is, is a great Division three story but doesn't generally don't have guys going to the NFL – Tell me a little bit, if you, if, is he on your radar at all? Are you familiar with him at all? Have you had a chance to, to look at him? Where are you on Ben Barch from St. John's? Don't know anything about him. Next question. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, he uh, just like he, he did a phenomenal job down at the Senior Bowl. And when you get in, these young school kids or these small school kids get an opportunity to go on a stage like that, yeah, it, it's amazing to see how they respond to that. And I know watching him during the week, he played left tackle. They moved him inside the guard. People are going to determine whether he's a guard or tackle or not. Yeah. Uh, but he matched up when he was at left tackle against some of the top pass rushers in the country down at the Senior Bowl. Mm -hmm. And then there was a little bit of an adjustment because that's a big switch going into guard. Yeah. But you can see him progress through the week when he did get guard reps. So, yeah, he's one of those guys that went down there and, and stepped up and, and proved that uh, he can play at a high level, which yet to be determined. Time for two more. Ben Lieber, Paul Charchi, and Paul Allen, Vikings general manager Rick Spielman from the Indianapolis Scouting Combine. Well, I was, I was, uh, my last question is going to be, you know, you, you added Dom Capers to the defensive side. You've got Gary Kubiak on the other side. Uh, he's obviously been here for a year. But this is an NFL that seems to be treading, trending younger. What are the benefits to having more experienced guys that are maybe a little older but have seen a lot of football the benefits of having those guys in the office versus a bunch of young whippersnappers? I think there's a fine mix, and I think uh, Coach Zimmer has done a phenomenal job of putting the old experienced guys together, and we got a lot of n young new guys uh, that are coming up through the ranks um, that we continue to try to develop because not only is it important to develop players, but the coaches have to develop coaches as well. But that's one thing that makes Coach Zimmer so unique is whether it's a Gary Kubiak, whether it's a Dom Capers, all what he's trying to do is give us the best opportunity to go out there and achieve our goals. And if it's bringing experience like that, that can add a different twist here or there to what we're doing defensively. Um, the impact that Gary Kubiak, I know Kevin Stefanski did a phenomenal job. He got a head coaching job. But Gary Kubiak's role in that offense and the impact he had and what a difference our offense took last year under, under Gary Kubiak. So those are the things I think make Coach Zimmer unique is because there's no ego in a building. All the, everybody wants to do is work together and try to achieve what we're ultimately trying to do is win that, uh, win that Super Bowl. Now, now Rick, last one uh, from me, and, and I'm not going to read between the lines with Stefan Diggs and his tweets <laughs> and things that have been speculated yeah. or guessed on nationally. Ah, ah Charch is like, like ah. <laughs> well, no, this, this is the last uh, one. Uh, I wish, I wish, I wish you were going to, you know, drop a bombshell right here. It ain't happening. <laughs> Why don't you answer since you've heard me answer questions so many years? I probably could. This is the last one, and um, you can obviously. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate <laughs> it. I, I just, I just want to ask you one question: Is when he left, where he is now, with the season from the weird week from two and two to picking up for Thielen, playing incredibly well, three touchdowns versus Philly, touchdown in the playoff game against the Niners, the whole thing. Are you comfortable? He still wants to be part of this team. <laughs> Yeah, no, we'll sit down with his agent, and Stefan is a very competitive player. 
but I also know what he means to this football team. Right. And to have blue type or top receivers, uh, and I think we have the best receiver pair in the league, and I, you know, uh, or at least one of the top receiving cores, because that also helped make our quarterback more successful. And Stefan has done so much, not only in the community, but what he does to win games on the football field as well. I, why wouldn't he be here? Right. Uh, well, that one more was it was like a, a morning workout before a race because your race is coming <laughs> up over there now, and they're going to hit it in elongated fashion. So we just put you through that drill. You handled the drill beautifully. In fact, I think you could win the verbal Kentucky Derby. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Rick Thank Gilman, General Manager, Minnesota Vikings, back after this.